I am Jennifer Edgeuse and have created this supplementary video called Application of the Equity and Empowerment Lens for Facilitators and Learners. The objectives of this podcast are to discuss why we need an equity and empowerment lens, to share how it developed, to show you the lens, and to demonstrate its application. The introductory module is the launching point for all subsequent modules and comes in two parts. The second part is called Shifting the Paradigm Toward Social Accountability. Here you will hear a short talk by myself introducing the concept of social accountability, and this is followed by a talk by Sonali Balaji, who introduces the framework of the equity and empowerment lens, which she developed. We believe this lens has enormous capacity to move us towards social accountability in healthcare. To supplement her theoretical talk, we wanted to provide a more hands-on review of the lens. So let's consider why we need the equity and empowerment lens. In reviewing the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Roadmap to Reduce Disparities, their primary tenant is linking quality and equity. Similarly, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement insists on first making health equity its strategic priority. However, those of us who champion health equity work often see that if we are not at the table, health equity falls off the table most often unintentionally. At a very basic level, the equity and empowerment lens provides a structured checklist to help keep health equity on the table, and we know that checklists have literally saved lives in our operating rooms and other healthcare setting. Let me take you back to 2005 when the city of Seattle launched its Race and Social Justice Initiative, which was a citywide effort to end institutional racism in city government and to achieve racial equity across their community. They started applying a racial equity lens to every intervention proposed across every division within its system. So for example, if you wanted to propose building a new bus stop or library in a neighborhood, that division or department would first have to apply an equity lens to the proposal. As a result of this initiative, Seattle doubled contracts with women and minority-owned businesses, dramatically expanded engagement with historically underrepresented communities, and soon had all departments using a racial equity toolkit. 175 miles south of Seattle, public health officials in Multnomah County, which is home to Portland, Oregon, became intrigued by the work happening in Seattle and so came up with a 2.0 version of their equity lens. This underwent several iterations, which ultimately became the equity and empowerment lens, which added such components as trauma-informed care. So what exactly is the equity and empowerment lens? The authors of the lens state, it is a quality improvement tool used to improve planning, decision-making, and resource allocation, leading to more equitable policies and programs. It can also be described as a set of principles, reflective questions, and processes that focus at the individual, institutional, and systemic levels by deconstructing what is not working around equity, reconstructing and supporting what is working, shifting the way we make decisions and think about this work, and healing and transforming our structures, our environments, and ourselves. This is the equity and empowerment lens, which you can see has five Ps, purpose, people, place, process, and power. Let's demonstrate how to use the lens with a case about improving hypertension for your clinic patients. You are part of a quality improvement team that is focusing on strategies to use the care team more effectively. During the monthly departmental faculty meeting, you learn that your department ranks 20th of 25 health systems on your state report card in hypertension control. You share this with your clinic QI team, which is a multidisciplinary cross-section of your clinic, including front and back office staff, ancillary staff such as a phlebotomist, and two faculty attendings, three family medicine residents, and one advanced care practitioner from your clinic. Your team wishes to focus on using the care team more effectively. After several rounds of discussion, the team proposes that all patients whose blood pressure is above 140 over 90 will have a repeat blood pressure taken by the rooming medical assistant or nurse, and if it remains elevated, the patient will be given a follow-up visit with nursing in two to three weeks, along with a computerized reminder letter. This is a reasonable and well-intentioned intervention, 
But what if we apply the equity and empowerment lens? Again, there are five P's to the equity empowerment lens, and the first is purpose. In our case, we want to improve blood pressure control for our patients. But let's be more explicit and state, we want to improve blood pressure control for all our patients, which really is your team's intent. Let's remember Robert Wood Johnson Foundation telling us to link quality and equity while the Institute of Healthcare Improvement instructs us to make health equity a strategic priority. You'll find in the appendix of both the guidebook and the introductory module a modified version of the equity and empowerment lens that was designed specifically to support clinical quality improvement work. This is called the equity and empowerment lens assessment worksheet. This slide shows questions to ask to help us flush out how we might think about purpose. In our example, we are trying to improve a clinical health metric. Specifically, we are trying to improve blood pressure control for our patients with uncontrolled hypertension. We are directing our efforts to all our patients with hypertension. When asked what data is driving this intention, in this case, our state report card ranks us 20th out of 25 healthcare systems. The next question asks, what is the data telling you about disparities experienced in the community? So here we start to have the aha moment of, we could disaggregate our data by gender and race or ethnicity. The last question asks if the data takes into account community priorities and culturally specific feedback. Here again, it is not clear, but members of your team might consider getting feedback based on the latest community health needs assessment done by the local hospital. Others remind you that you have some established community partners and we could ask them. Your phlebotomist thinks we could simply ask our patients and consider a waiting room survey that would get culturally specific feedback. Let's return to the original equity and empowerment lens and go through the prompts about connections to people, but you can also continue to use the equity and empowerment lens assessment worksheet. The first question asks, who is positively and negatively affected by this intervention and how? In this case, we now consider that it favors those who can get off work easily, those who have access to transportation, and those who have a mailbox and can read English. The next question asks, how are people differently situated in terms of barriers they experience? People will experience more barriers if they are the working poor or perhaps homebound due to age, disability, or language. Finally, we ask, are people traumatized by your decision area? We often call people who don't follow up non-compliant and blame them for their failings when we haven't fully explored the circumstances that act as systemic barriers. People can feel inadequate and demoralized, ashamed and hopeless and disengaged. The next P is place. How is your intervention accounting for people's emotional and physical safety and the need to feel productive and feel valued? Again, we are not considering how it may be difficult for some patients to take time off work and who have more limited leave policies. How are you considering environmental impacts as well as environmental justice? Now your team considers that many patients have home blood pressure cuffs and could report their home blood pressures by phone or through electronic patient portals rather than drive to the clinic. How are public resources and investments distributed geographically we have invoked a relatively low-cost computer-generated mailing intervention, but further root cause analysis may reveal it would be more effective to telephone our patients. Process is the next P. How are we meaningfully including or excluding people who are affected? We did not originally disaggregate the data by gender, race, or ethnicity. You might also realize there's only one person of color on your QI team. What policies, processes, and social relationships contribute to the exclusion of communities most affected by inequities? Here you see that the leadership did not provide disaggregated data to explore. You also see that most of the clinics in your system don't have patient and family advisory committees, and those that do tend to be white, retired, middle-class people. Are there empowering processes at every human touch point? We did not ask for feedback from our patients when we designed this intervention. 
What processes are traumatizing and how do we improve them? The reminder letter may be received and read, but as the patient may not be able to get time off or can't find childcare, this may be re-traumatizing for someone who is already frustrated and not being able to accomplish their goals. Maybe the letter isn't even received by the patient and the patient may be accused of multiple no-shows and be given a disciplinary letter. The final P is power. What are the barriers to doing equity and racial justice work? We are not incentivized to apply an equity lens. What are the benefits and burdens that communities experience with this issue? Communities are not given the opportunity to engage in the design of the intervention, so interventions may not be community-centric, further exacerbating disparities in outcomes. Who is accountable? The blood pressure metric is incentivized holding clinicians accountable by the healthcare system. People do not hold us accountable. What is your decision-making structure? Our QI team is made up of clinicians and staffs. It does not include patients. How is the current intervention shifting power dynamics to better integrate voices and priorities of communities of color? I'll let you consider the answer to this question. Since this QI project was undertaken several years ago, my clinic established a patient and family advisory committee that is fairly representative of our diverse patient population, and we now involve them regularly on our QI projects. We hope application of the equity and empowerment lens will not be merely transactional, but transformative, as discussed by Sonali Balaji. Five potential key questions might be purpose. What is the problem you are trying to solve? Describe your proposed intervention. People. Which patients are positively and negatively affected by this intervention? Place. How does this intervention account for people's and patients' emotional and physical safety and their need to be productive and feel valued? Process. How are we meaningfully including and excluding patients in the process? Power. How could we better integrate voices and priorities of all stakeholders? In each module of the Health Equity Curricular Toolkit, we will provide an actionable section where we hope you will practice application of the equity and empowerment lens to help seek answers and solve problems based on the topic discussed. Here you see an example of this section in our module called Understanding Health Experiences and Values to Address Social Determinants of Health. We hope you found this podcast helpful in demonstrating the practical use of the equity and empowerment lens. Please contact me with any questions or feedback. Thank you for using the Health Equity Curricular Toolkit. We hope the learning we do in working through these modules and the skills acquired will help us all keep health equity in the forefront of our work. Thank you.